Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I would like to welcome all of you who joined us online at this uh, side event. Um, I want to offer my appreciation to IFLA and particularly to Stephen Weiber, who masterfully orchestrated this uh, uh, session today, and of course to my United Nations colleagues. Today's discussion uh, takes place during the SDI 2021 forum, which focuses on science, technology, and innovation for a sustainable and resilient COVID-19 recovery, and effective pathways for inclusive action towards the sustainable development goals. The many discussions and ideas in this forum will inform the high-level political forum, which will take place at the UN in July 2021, which is the second most important event in the UN Secretariat in New York. A key element of both inclusion and resilience is the possibility for all to take part in scientific research. And this is vital because so often local development challenges are best approached by local researchers. The need to be able to learn from those who have come before rather than duplicate effort is more pressing in countries with less developed research infrastructures. And then COVID-19 came. It became also question, a question of resilience. The ability to access, access to research has now become a question of resilience, since being able to find information and use it is essential for individuals and communities to respond to the unexpected. And the whole world has now witnessed that the human race doesn't always have the control. Open access to scientific information is of course well established with large shares of new publications, at least in some disciplines and some parts of the world, immediately available to anyone with an internet connection. However, it is not yet universal. And as we have seen in pandemic times, the availability of quality information does not always mean that it is used and referred to. Our discussion today with esteemed colleagues will center around challenges and solutions and will help us identify what further barriers we need to overcome to be able to ensure that open access realizes its full potential to support inclusive and sustainable development for all. I'll give the floor back to Stephen now and thank you very much once again. So thank you very much, Tanos. And before we actually start and we hand over to all of our, our esteemed speakers today, we wanted to run a couple of polls just to get a sense of where you think we are. So I'm going to, and I'm going to allow panelists to vote on this one. So a question should now appear on your screen. And the first is, to what extent do you agree with the statement that open access should be seen as an essential part of efforts to achieve the SDGs? And then you've got options running from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then the second question you should see on your screen is to what extent do you agree with the statement, I apologize for the typo there, we are on track to realizing the full potential of open access to support development by 2030. So I hope you should all good for getting some answers in already. A couple of people have responded. That's good, they're really coming in now. Good, almost half of our participants have now voted so I'm going to give it another 15 seconds we'll get up to a full minute and five four three two one I'm going to end the poll and share the results and so you'll see that I think probably given the title of the event it's not a surprise that uh, over 84 percent of participants believe that open access should be seen as an essential part of efforts to deliver on the SDGs and the rest is agreed, so that's very positive. But going down, um, looking down the screen, we can see that um, you can see that actually people are a little bit less, pe more pessimistic about whether we're on track to realising the full potential of open access to support development by 2030. I think that's really what this event is about, trying to understand what are those steps, what are those additional actions that need to be taken to realize this potential. So now I'm happy to hand over to the first of our speakers, Omo Waya, 
and OMO is Chief Technology Officer of the West and Central African Research and Education Network, or WACRAN. In this role, he's responsible for technical assets, counseling and supporting members, and counseling and supporting members on technical issues. He was part of the task team set up by the Association of African Universities that led to the incorporation of WACREN and has been at the heart of efforts linked to open access, including the People's Open Access Initiative and LibSense. So with that, over to you, Omo. Sorry, Stephen. Um, thank you very much. I was just struggling with my mute button. Thank you very much for having me here. I'll just share some slides, which I want to run through very quickly. So just a little bit of a correction there. I used to be the CTO. My new title is Chief Strategy Officer. I'm basically responsible for strategy and uh, business development in Wakran. So WACREN is a West and Central African Research Education Network. What I propose to do today is uh, describe our experience with uh, OPEN. Uh, this is in Africa. WACREN is based in West Africa. Our experience has been largely, largely through two projects. So the first one is the Africa Connect project, which is in its third iteration. It was um, this was a project established to improve the connectivity of research and education in Africa through uh, by promoting research networks and interconnecting them. And the second one is uh, an open science community that emerged from uh, this activity. So I'm, I'm just going to run through the and try and describe this as quickly as I can. Yeah. So uh, so what's the problem? Yeah, the problem is familiar to most is the digital divide. Africa is only contributing 2% uh, to, to the world's research output according to UNESCO. Internet penetration is still a large problem in Africa in many parts. It's improved immensely, but uh, still a problem. Uh, in terms of uh, ratios, Africa has only 91 researchers per million people compared to uh, thousands in uh, some other continents. Investment in, in tech is actually quite low. And meanwhile, we have lots of potential, um, but access to co connectivity, reliable and affordable connectivity is a problem. So this is just a little graph that compares GNI per capita to uh, broad, broadband prices. You see in some countries like Guinea-Bissau, Rwanda, Niger, Madagascar. Uh, uh, Omo, can I ask, are you sharing your screen at the moment? I am. Oh, we, we can't see it. Beg your pardon. I I thought I was. Um, so now we're good. You've got your yeah. Thank you. Can you see that now? Yes, absolutely. So this was what I was going through. So I'm just going to go through it and save some time. Um, so we're talking about the digital divide. And then the GNI per capita compared to the prices in some of those countries, in, in, in some cases, is 100%. Uh, and we're talking about low bandwidth compared to their sort of, say, in this case, European counterparts. So the Africa Connect 3 project is, a, is an EU supported project. It has African partners contributing some of the funding, uh, up to 20% of it. So for the, because the audience might be, not familiar with NRENs. NRENs are basically non-profit organizations dedicated to supporting research and education through high capacity connectivity and value-added services. So you can think uh, identity infrastructure, cloud, HPCs, data, connecting HPCs and other kind of uh, infrastructure. So in Africa, there are three regional RENs. You can see them on the um, the, the, the side colored green is Western, Af Western Central Africa, where I work in. Uh, Asren is in is North Africa, and uh, the Bundan Alliance is South and East Africa. So the colors that are shaded are the countries that are connected, currently connect, or countries currently connected in our regions. So this is an, this project is, um, like I said, the third iteration. 
it's um it's from the beginning you can see in the map i would just try to show uh, graphically how the connectivity has improved in africa since we started so these are con connections from countries towards europe and within africa so in all we have connected to in three out of 38 african NRENs. Uh, in the case of Wakren, we have seven connections. Now the connections that I put in bold, Benin, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire are actually currently being procured and they should be live at the end of this month. But in, in overall, you can see a growing picture of connectivity uh, in the region. And this is part of a global framework. So this slide tries to depict, you know, the campuses or the regional, the research and education institutions at the far left connecting to their respective national networks. Those networks connecting to regional networks in Africa and through those networks to world regions. And um, it, the same thing happens on the other side. This is the same thing in Asia, Latin America and in North America. So what this provides uh, through the Africa Connect Free project, we now have researchers in universities and uh, research institutions able to interact and collaborate with themselves and other international peers through these networks. So I'm not going to waste too much time on the value propositions. I'm sure they're, they're sort of, you know, um, apparent to most. They are non we are nonprofit organizations basically looking at uh, the public good now these internet, these connections are not internet connections. These are dedicated, uncongested internet connections, layered with, uh, you know, middleware for authentication and education services that are dedicated to enable collaboration between research and education actors. And they, I showed you the slide about uh, global connections. And what's also important to highlight here is the economies of scale that this provides for uh, the participants. So I can, to give an example of sort of scale we're talking about, when Zambia was connected, the Zamran, the Zambian NREN, the price dropped by 94%. The price, the cost of connectivity per megabit per second dropped by 94%. Now, our experience is that these NRENs, these communities, they don't necessarily spend more money. They just get a whole lot of capacity because of the price, price decrease. So that's happened. These are just examples. But you can see the, the sort of rates we're talking about in terms of the uh, drop in price. So we have over just 2,000 2, connect, institutions connected in the different regional RENs. We are connecting universities in the remote areas. We are basically, because we are providing uh, sort of state-of-the-art services in these environments, we are actually retaining local talent and seeing more of our seeing more postdocs in the region. Now, what's important here to mention, although I don't have a slide on it, is the fact that this, especially in the remote areas, these networks can be extended by community networks you know, easily, because if you've already taken the, the sort of the connection to that university, there's enough capacity there to build a community network to serve the immediate, you know, environment, whether that might be a local government or it just might be a public library uh, that is acting as a digital hub. So that's one. Now, the second project I was going to talk about was Lipsense. So, while we're doing all of this and sort of uh, building out the connectivity, we also have some sort of uh, complementary projects, trying to build capacity uh, with open access repositories, building capacity with science gateways. So we run through these projects and find out that there's, uh, there's basically a missing link. So while we were there with all the researchers and the sort of technology, what was missing uh, which we identified after some investigation was the information management capabilities that librarians brought into the room. So Libsense basically emerged out of that. So Libsense is a community for, to promote open science in Africa, where it is essentially a library, national research education network collaboration. 
And then the idea here was, you know, there are all kinds of issues. So the libraries, the librarians had uh, technical deficits that the NRENs could, could close. The NRENs had infrastructure that we needed librarians to basically provide input, first of all, as you know, in the information management roles, and also to act as focal points on campus to, to, to be liaisons and a conduit for the capacity we were, we were providing. So the LibSense basically provides technical support, it builds capacity. And importantly, uh, because these services make more sense when they are local, uh, the community basically develops, uh, looks at developing value added services that are contextual uh, to the environment in which they're being built. So who is LibSense at the moment? You know, so we've got the three regional rents in Africa uh, and Giant, Giant is the European network. We're all partners in Africa Connect3. Uh, we have, um, uh, from the beginning, we've had a research partner with the University of Sheffield uh, for the international dimensions. Uh, we, there's the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. I fold the Electronic Information for Libraries is a pretty, uh, I'm sure that's a well-known organization, especially in Africa. Uh, then there's the National Informatics Institute of Japan and Open Air Project from, uh, from Europe. Now, these were the initial partners, but now there are just too many to list. We are a vibrant community across Africa. We work across three groups, uh, you know, policies, infrastructure, and capacity building across the three major languages in, in Africa, Arabic, English, and French. And then we, we have uh, sort of made a statement about where we want to go to, and I suppose this is what feeds into some of the questions we're going to be raised here. What do we see as uh, the principles for uh, open science, open access in Africa? So those are the major elements. You know, we want to be able to create a, a scenario that addresses inequality and supports equity, diversity, and social justice. This is, this is particularly important in our case where there is, a, um, there, is, there is a sort of dichotomy between what we experience and what is experienced in the so-called global north. Now, just so that this is sustainable long-term, it is important for us that the infrastructures that we develop are led by Africa led and operated. And another thing that we think is uh, vital uh, to development of open in Africa is uh, uh, the support and promotion of uh, indigenous and traditional knowledge. So in our communities, now there are efforts to co-create knowledge with with this, with practitioners in this area, so that we can use that, we can sort of produce this in open access repositories. So for the actions in this, because what we have defined is this statement we made about what our community represents, we'd like to uh, strengthen equitable, kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, reinforce that as much as we, uh, enough. Equitable partnerships of editors, publishers, the major stakeholders, they can actually provide immediate open access to African research via means that um, are supported, journals, repositories, preprints, whatever, that are supported by the scholarly communication landscape today. And we think this, is, um, uh, this has to be community-led and collaborative to be sustainable. Now, I am running out of time, so I'll just, this is my last slide. I thought it was important to mention this uh, because within the community, we have started something called the uh, National Open Science Roadmaps. They basically leverage the UNESCO Open Science Partnership to put the open science agenda before all the right stakeholders at a national level. Now, the objectives are straightforward. We want to be able to sort of develop uh, or promote the, the, the discussions and conversations within countries that basically lead to the development of roadmaps and action plans. And the objectives are really to sort of get shared understanding of what the value is, open access, open data, open science. And many, many countries are familiar with open data now, but less with open access and open science. We want to be able to solve collectively within those national boundaries do some priority setting where the gaps in infrastructural skills are just have identified. And um, in a recent, we just finished the Wakran 2021 conference in March, and there is a, I'm going to share the slides, but 
for those interested, you should you can see in because we had a session dedicated to open access and open science. You can see some of the countries running national open access repositories uh, via the NRENs uh, at that link. This is the end of my slide. I thought you were just since we were talking development, we could um, I could just list the SDGs that we mapped to uh, with our activities here in in um, Africa Connect Three and um, Lipsense, and um, we touch four, five, eight, and nine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I might ask you to yeah, excellent. You stop sharing your slides. Thank you very much, and I think that was it was really helpful. Not just obviously the reminder of how connectivity and decent connectivity is vital for open access, but also those questions of ownership and making sure it's not imposed. It's something that's let, that, that's owned by the people who are doing it, but owned, in Africa is owned by Africans, and that it's taking account of indigenous traditional knowledge. So now I'd like to hand on to Ellen Tice. Um, Ellen is Principal Director of Library and Information Services at Stellenbosch University in South Africa and a past president of IFLA. She was also the first president of the Library and Information Association of South Africa from 1998 to 2002. And is currently chair of IFLA's Advisory Committee on Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression. In addition to her library management work, she's published extensively on issues around access to knowledge open access and wider librarianship in Africa. With that, over to you, Alan. Thank you. Ellen, you're, you're muted, I fear. Oh, it always happens. That's better. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and also thank you for the invitation to participate uh, this evening. I'm also going to uh, just share um, my screen. Uh, I have a few slides. Um, there we go. Good. So, so I will be uh, covering the four topics that you see on, on my agenda. Um, and um, firstly, looking at open access and developing countries. Um, open access and development, and I'd like to give two concrete examples of how uh, libraries um, through open access contributes, of course, to the sustainable development goals. Um, following on what Omo had said, um, I'll also just from a different perspective contextualize open access in Africa. And then being from South Africa, of course, I also like to share the roadmap or the steps that we want to take in South Africa uh, to also real, uh, realize the full potential um, of open access. So when we look at um, open access um, in, in develop, uh, development countries, um, um, I'd like to start off, you know, being, um, you know, this in partnership with the UN and this particular um, a forum that we are uh, participating in this evening. As we know, the um, UN Declaration on Human Rights, um, speaking of freedom of expression and so on, but it is it's now been well established that access to information. So I think when we look overall at open access, when you look at you know, um, how we want to achieve the sustainable development goals, and if we look at um, you know, how uh, the, the pandemic the environment that we find ourselves in now, um, that is so crucial, and, and Tano said also said that right at the start, um, all the basis for whatever development we can think of is in terms of access to information. Um, if we can get that right, I think we can solve many, many problems uh, that we have in the world. Um, with that, um, it's not just the access, but of course, it is the equal access to knowledge and information that's critical. Um, and especially uh, when we consider the uh, differences and the imbalances um, in the world as one had also found now um, with the availability of vaccines. Um, you know, how important that is that, you know, for um, the rich countries to survive, uh, they also have to do a lot in order to, the same with developing countries. Of course, and that is because there is a higher inequality in developing countries. Um, researchers, uh, again, we've heard from um, the side of, of OMO, previous speaker, 
um, how much we contribute um, to uh, research, um, um, you know, the, the, the global research output. Um, and therefore researchers rely then heavily on research from developed countries. Very small numbers of libraries in the, in the developing world um, could afford a subscription prices due to lack of funding. And of course, um, the big benefit is that open access had brought a new model for dissemination of knowledge um, at little or no cost to the developing world. But in terms of the questions that um, Stephen had asked in the beginning, um, yes, we, I would say we have uh, made progress. However, um, hurdles uh, remain and that the battle for unrestricted unrestrict access is far from over. For example, if we look at the current model um, where publishers are moving or trying to move, or of course, of course, also authors and many institutions have also been calling for this, um, that we move away from a subscription pay to read, but pay to publish. However, this focus on the author's pay model now undermines actually the progress that we have been made up till now. And it is important, I think, therefore, uh, to ensure that author fees paying to publish required by open access journals does not become an impediment. Um, if you're considering the average fee of about um, $2,373 US dollars, um, uh, that is quite a, a challenge. Um, it may not be much for a well-funded researcher in the developed world, but it is a significant, it is significant in developing countries where research funding is already scarce. So publishers waiving this fee can mitigate the difference. However, in the long run, the solution must lie in making the cost of publication as an essential component of any research grant. And it should be the same and comparable to buying supplies in scientific equipment. So waiving of such fees may not be possible in the developing world because many of these journals rely on subscription and thus restricted access to cover basic editorial and production costs. Now, Susan Murray um, from the African Journals Online, she said, um, stated that there's a danger that developing country researchers might therefore desert their local journals because they're unable to afford to go open access while waiving author fees. And this, Murray says, would undermine the key role that such journals can play in promoting locally funded research based around needs and priorities determined in developing countries rather than by the scientific community in the developed world. So there are still too many obstacles to the free flow of scientific information. Um, and I think, you know, from the publishers to restrictive intellectual property laws and unsympathetic research um, institutions, and sometimes even from, from some governments. So, so how does um, um, open access uh, uh, contribute to development? There is no dispute that there is a tremendous, the tremendous contributions, open access to scientific information and data, data might have for development, both on economic and social fronts. Open access might transform the lives of millions in developing countries in many ways. It has an incredible potential for knowledge dissemination, innovation, acceleration, and improving the lives of many, all realizing the far reaching effects. And this includes non-governmental organizations, development agencies, everybody, researchers, citizens, all that we realize the far reaching effects of open access are promoting open development models, which based on an open access to information to data. And this can basically unleash economic value, address democratic shortfalls, improve learning and advance science. So the impact of OA on education, elections, agriculture, health services, and the environment, all of these um, would make a huge difference in all countries and assist with the development um, of all countries in the world. So the concrete of results of open access has already demonstrated its immense potential in enhancing efficiency and opportunity for all. So um, the economic benefits that both develop and developed countries might harvest from open access are huge. 
um, open data could generate, and this has been said by the IDRC, the Industrial uh, Development um, um, Corporation of, in, in Canada, uh, President Jean Lebel indicated that open data alone could generate more than $3 trillion US dollars additional economic values a year. This is a huge economic benefit that individual country policymakers and open access advocates should not ignore. For institutions in the developing nations, open access provides diverse opportunities. Some of these benefits are cost saving, visibility, and knowledge democratization. For many institutions in the developing world, cost related challenges are in the heart of all problems. This is particularly true for resources, stretch universities and research institutions, which normally rely on a limited number of journals due to the high cost of subscription. Open access effectively liberates those institutions from these absurdly high subscription fees. The resources saved as a result of access to freely available scientific outputs can be used to develop or expand core educational and research infrastructures. Now, I just want to give you two examples of practical examples. And this relates to the pandemic, what, and again, what um, uh, Tanos had said right at the start, um, how crucial and how important it was during the pandemic to make information, scientific information available to help to address, you know, the a danger that we basically face and what has actually happened. So if you look here, so we um, at Stellenbosch University Library, we um, uh, publish uh, about 25 open access journals or we um, support the publication of that and we host this on a platform in the library. And uh, one of those titles is the South African uh, Journal, um, Hard Journal. And here you can see the statistics. Um, you know, of this journal, for example. But what is uh, particularly um, interesting um, is that um, when we look at the, and sorry, I just need to, to get my notes here. So, 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 so these, the statistics here basically um, tell us um, how the journal was used in 2020. And it gives a general idea of what traffic to the journal's website looked like in the past year. The figures are based on the timeline 1 January 2020 to 31 December 2020 and gleaned from Google Analytics. The report does not necessarily an indication of impact, but merely of use of the journal. Now, if we look at the statistics, for example, 17 out of 45 articles published over three issues in 2020 were COVID-19 related. The top user locations for these um, articles uh, were actually South Africa, of course, expected, um, then the United States, then India, then the United Kingdom, then Hong Kong, Canada, France, Australia, and the Netherlands. So it's across the world where people have actually um, um, used this. And then if you look at uh, what I, the previous slide was just the top um, 10 articles, three out of the 10 most read articles in the journal in 2020 were COVID-19 related. Then I'd like to share with you just another example in this case, in terms of addressing the um, sustainable development goals. Again, this is from our, um, from our institutional uh, repository. Um, and here trying to uh, focus and addresses the SDG two of goal two, end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. It has been the, one of the most viewed and downloaded items on our repository since it was uploaded in 2007. Um, in terms of open access, this is resources available only in our repository. Um, and therefore the statistics that you see here, um, again, um, um, if you look at the views, if you look at the downloads, uh, the citations on, on, on Google uh, Scholar. But what was interesting for us to note is one of the sources which cited this thesis, because this was a thesis that's, that's basically has been produced at Stellenbosch University. Um, another thesis, it was cited in another thesis, which looked practically at the transformation of agricultural and underdeveloped land in a region in South Africa and came up with suggestions on how to optimally and sustainably use the land for agriculture and food security. 
This thesis in turn has been cited six times. Now, this is an example of how open access research can reach practical levels of planning and improvement in a country in support of this uh, sustainable um, development goals. I think I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time because I think Omo has already addressed most of this, but I just want to mention that, um, um, and as he had done already, we um, and contextualizing open access, the important thing is here that we need to look at models that meet the imperatives of the region or the countries in which um, we are, make, have, where we have these initiatives. And it's very important for us that such a view, open access should be driven by social justice and equity principles. Again, it has been mentioned already a number of times. So I'll, um, I'll just move on um, to the um, roadmap of uh, to open access for South Africa. So the South African government has placed open science and open access on the national agenda. Uh, agenda. It is led by the National Site License for Open Access Project and led by key role players, including University South Africa, who represents all the universities, the Academy of Science of South Africa, the National Research Foundation, the South African National Library and Information Consortium, and the departments of National Departments of Higher Education and Training and Science and Innovation. So the commitment here is really to drive scientific progress um, and to make sure that we also to fund that all fun, um, um, public funded scientific research uh, results should be open to all. The vision is to democratize knowledge and achieve e equity of, ac of access. And some of the steps here that um, has been uh, identified in terms of the roadmap for South Africa could be is around engagement that we need to um, uh, design an advocacy program for researchers, et cetera, research administration, um, that of course there needs to be institutional, national policies around the adoption and steps to implementing these. We have to have sustainable infrastructure, establishing repositories, et cetera, that there needs to be a legal framework to govern the relationship between authors, publishers, and the users of the repository, supporting open access journals, which uh, many of the institutions where we do publish also, uh, and support uh, publishing of open access journals, that there needs to be a long-term commitment. There should be agreed goals and principles of open access incorporated into the institutional strategies, and of course, we need to remove the barriers on the way, identifying which, which are the barriers, uh, both at a system and at an institutional level. And here, I've already mentioned earlier on, if you look at, for example, article processing fees, um, that certainly those are some of the barriers that we need. And then, of course, as we've also heard earlier, that we, in terms of LipSense and other uh, many initiatives that we need to look at alternative uh, publication platforms. Just lastly, I've mentioned the South African National Library Consortium um, uh, plays, because this is the consortium that deals with subscriptions, play a leading role to achieve then these goals. Um, and uh, the consortium in 2020 adopted um, the following statement by saying that um, Sandlick holds the position that South Africa is not ready for transformative agreements, which have of course happened in many other parts of the world and that transformational agreements must be explored to foster social justice and inclusivity. The influence of COVID-19 must be given serious consideration in developing a transformational open access strategy to ensure marginalized global self scholarship is accessible to the widest reading audience. Acknowledging that global South scholarship matters, there is a, a dire need for a fit for purpose model, a multi pronged model that demonstrates inclusivity, a model based around social justice principle. And in conclusion, yes, we are on track, as we've seen from the results earlier on, but there's still a lot of work to be done so that developing countries can meaningfully participate and benefit in open access. Um, we need to develop differentiated models that meet the needs of countries and regions, and they can't be a one-size-all uh, solution. Um, there's no doubt, as I said, open access can accelerate the SDGs. Social justice is imperative for success. And of course, um, I just want to share with you also, um, just um, uh, this is a guide of the Bits University 
um, and it has several resources on open access um, and developing countries. So you could also just go to Wits University uh, Library and look at their lib guide on um, open access in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen, and thank you also in particular for that conclusion slide just before that set out so clearly those elements that we can hopefully get right. Um, we'll just let you take. Yes. Uh, yes. Let me just. It's it's down. There. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. As I said, th thank you for those conclusions and really underlining that it's not necessarily simple. We can't so easily just switch to open and it's, there's not necessarily a one size fits all approach. So definitely know where more thinking is going to be needed. I now want to hand over to Jonathan Hernandez Perez. Um, Jonathan is an associated researcher at the Library and Information Institute at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He's a past president of the National College of Librarians of Mexico as well and a governing board member of IFLA. He is active in research around misinformation, censorship, privacy, and digital and, and digital and the digital forgotten. His recent publications focus on information diversity on the internet and internet misinformation from a library perspective. And today he's going to talk a little bit about open access and information diversity. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks for the invitation also. Thank you, Thanos, and it's good to see you all here. I'm going to share my screen. Yes, I think that done. Well, thanks again. Uh, I would like to start by briefly defining the concept of information uh, diversity. Sorry. Yeah. Well, over the last decades, we have seen several terms trying to address all the dynamics around information and society. The current trend now is the so-called infodemic or disinfodemic, depending uh, the way you want to look. And uh, well, so information diversity or infodiversity as a concept comes from the early 90s, when there was an interesting debate about the inequalities in the demand and supply of information for the underdeveloped countries. Particularly, this was a discussion in Latin America. And the way monopolies and big information companies had created one side and loaded flows of information, hindering access to all the diversity of information produced mainly by the multiple cultures and ethnic groups with a strong involvement in social, economic, and political matters. Somehow, the information flows were developed to suit corporate interest, guiding society to consume just one source format or type of information. I must say that this was before the significant adoption of the internet. So uh, in a very wider uh, general terms, this concept refers to the variety of types, forms, and formats in which information is produced and consumed. It also encompasses all expression made by different social groups over time within a geographic area or different media or historical periods. It is a way to understand and see a larger picture of what and how we produce, consume, and share information. And now I'm moving to the open access and open science development and information society and information diversity. In all societies, information diversity, we all know, has been a driver for development. And the digital moment we're living in just came to highlight this reality the COVID-19 pandemic has driven the adoption of certain openness principles, but it also poses new challenge to this movement. It should be noted that when we talk about open science, we also referring to many core open practices, such as open access, open source, open data, open peer review, and in each of these practices, there is a diversity of approaches and a diversity of people uh, involving in all these practices. Much of these practices enable new spaces for collaboration and co-creation. The open movement is also a diverse movement. And then we have some challenge. Uh, open access and open science face important challenge in terms of information diversity, such as the gap between languages, 
Uh, this is because the prevalence of a single language suggests that all important information is just in that language. And this is a, a, a big problem, especially for regions like Latin America. And there is also an increasing oligopolistic market characterized by reduced competition and higher prices. And of course, uh, there is the rise of policies that may exacerbate existing inequalities. We all know that there are local policies that still concentrate on the impact factor of the mainstream journals for promotion and evaluation. So information diversity is a multidimensional approach. There are, there are also more implications about this. For example, in a technical way, there is a rise of repositories, uh, particularly in the Latin American region that where this has been a priority for national and institutional open access policy policies. And, and in this particular case, in a technical view, it should also consider that repositories, they need to be res responsive to local needs and priorities. And the most critical aspect, uh, they should enhance their capacity to provide open access to the diverse contents and formats of the research cycle and the many ways scholarly communication is produced. Well, the COVID-19 outbreak represents an urgent threat to global health, and it also is a threat to our information ecosystem. We are facing the consequences of a massive disinformation. Many of the current open access publications about the COVID-19 have contributed to the development of a body of knowledge that is helping to understand the health crisis we are facing. But on the other hand, there is an impressive information overload that can lead to confusion and the discredit of open movements. Uh, we have uh, several examples. The students have already been retracted, uh, false claims with a potential dramatic impact on public health, among others. And people without the skills in media information literacy are especially vulnerable to disinformation campaigns. So open access and open science are fundamental to equity and inclusion in academia and the general public. They promote the ability to people to read, to learn, and to debate new topics with one another that would otherwise be impossible for many. They also allow a greater diversity of people to engage with a discussion. It also enables new ideas and approaches to circulate that could bridge, could bridge the gap between academia and the public. So in order to build a widely open society, we should consider openness as a mean to development, openness as a mean to diversity, and as a mean to inclusion. As the world realizes the high importance of open access and open science, this will have to improve their diversity and inclusion dynamic. So open access are working uh, with several SDG, and by this approach, this SDG will be both will be boasted. And particularly, the SDG number ten, which is reduce inequalities. If we want to address the larger picture of inequalities, we must consider information inequalities also, which manifest themselves in many different gaps in terms of information like the gender gap, like a language gap, and the skill gaps. Well, oh, I have something before this. And finally, open access and open science are a great strategy for bringing the gap between scientists and the public. For this, it is essential to consider placing language diversity policies at the center of the debates about open movements, promote sharing of experience and good practices, and guide and inspire governmental bodies of the, on the benefits of open access and open science. And of course, we need a diverse empirical research of, open, of openness. So the diversity of information is essential to social development and human survival as biodiversity and cultural diversity. This takes us beyond thinking about traditional ways in which information is produced, consumed, shared, and preserved to thinking about information through, a, through an evolutionary approach. The library is a crucial player in the open movement, in the open science, in the open access, not only in providing the information, but as a partner in the process. 
the library also must be seen as a driver for capacity building in all the open movements. So that uh, will be my presentation. These are some reference. And thank you very much. Seven minutes. Very good. Well kept to time, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you again for highlighting. And I think this follows on very well from what Ellen was saying about the importance of thinking about how we can ensure that open access is a force for diversity, is a way of ensuring that diverse information can be shared because that, that's how it's going to be the best, best possible contribution to development. So with that, I now want to invite Delara Begum, Dr. Delara Begum, to the floor. And Dr. Begum is the Associate Professor and Chairperson in the Department of Information Studies and Library Management at East West University in Bangladesh. Her research interests include information management, digital libraries, information literacy, open access, and others. She's considered one of the pioneers of digital library buildings in Bangladesh and internationally. She was recognized as one of the Professor Indira Parikh 50 Women in Education Leaders in 2018 at the World Education Congress. Over to you, Dilara. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Bangladesh, especially for those who are seeing today, for the viewers. And uh, my topic is basically, I will talk about open access development and informed literacy. And this is very important in a sense, like open access and the informed literacy is very related. So before starting the, uh, my slide, I would like to know about uh, you know, uh, the interest of, of open access in, in Bangladesh. Basically, I will, I will emphasize on what's happening in Bangladesh and uh, I will give you the examples of East Coast University, what we are doing over here. So uh, for the basic level, I can say the open access, what is open access? Open access basically, I can say that which uh, it's defined by the Budapest Open Access Initiative that is taken in 2002. And uh, they have defined like uh, what are the information are, you know, resources are freely available um, on, on public internet and permitting of any users to read it, download it, copy, distribute, print and search, or link to the full text of these articles and call them for indexing pass them as a data to software or use them for any other lawful purpose without financial, legal, and technical barriers. And you have to remember for the give the authors control over the integrity of their work and the right to be properly acknowledged and cited. So this is actually I have taken from Budapest Open Access Initiative and they have mentioned in their website. Uh, and this open access has actually has immediate and diverse implication for how users at all levels discover and make use of information. Timely and accessible information basically helps to eliminate you know, poverty, injustice, enhance agriculture, provide high quality education, and promote people's health, culture, research, and innovation. Uh, basically, the availability of open access resources has grown at you know, you know at uh, unprecedented rate since the signing of the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which is taken in 2002. And uh, since then, basically, uh, the government agencies, universities, libraries, and other stakeholders have introduced and expanded initiative to make open access content freely available and accessible. So in that case, along with this access of the research and other essential elements is open access to data. Open access to data is very important in a sense, very vital because this availability of open access data uh, actually help us to attain the SDGs target. So uh, what are the open access and uh, COVID-19? How it is related? Because we are surrounded with the information and uh, we can say the information explosion is everywhere and we are passing a very crucial time. So this is a very crisis moment. Uh, and in that case, I would like to mention, it's said by the Director General of World Health Organization, he has said, we are not just fighting an epidemic, we are fighting an infodemic. And you also, he also mentioned that the fake news that spread faster and more easily than uh, this virus. So this is a very crucial time for us. 
to to you know combat this infodemic. So infodemic basically uh, it's 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 a, it's a massive amount of information that basically be very difficult to deal with that information. Very difficult to to identify the solution, and it can spread mis mis spread misinformation, disinformation, and rumors again during this you know, health emergency situation. Infodemic can hamper and public health responses and create confusion, distrust among people. So that's why we have to careful about this infodemic situation. But thing is that what is the solution? How we can overcome of this solution from, from this you know, infodemic situation? Um, in, in from, I can say that informed literacy is skill is one of the best way to to uh, you know uh, face this kind of uh, problem like infodemic. So what is information literacy? Information literacy is a, a set of abilities that require individuals to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively that needed information. So if you are informally literated, then, then you can face this infodemic situation easily. So what are the related relation between informational literacy and the COVID-19? During this uncertain time of COVID-19, actually we, we information seems to be a vital factor on the possibilities of concluding the global pandemic. And this is not only important for fighting with this virus of COVID-19, this is equally very, very important for fighting with this infodeping uh, regarding this COVID-19. Because of this social media and some other internet, uh, through this media, we are getting a lot of information and we are a little bit puzzled. We don't know what to do, how to deal with this uh, information. So without information literacy skill, people are coming to lack of information, dependence upon others for access to the knowledge and information, and even to accurate levels of information anxiety. So this is a serious issue. So this is uh, I put I put like open access uh, facilities like open access means the resource availability knowledge dissemination and how it is related to IL because information literacy will help you to know about what are the resources that are available that that it will create the awareness. And then for the knowledge dissemination part is very important. And I will uh, inform to literacy skill will help you to critically evaluate that uh, uh, you know uh, information which is available, which is surrounded by us, and uses rate will be high. And all these are together like open access and IL. We can if you get a relationship, it's due. It's related to staff development, student development, faculty development, research development, service development, collection development, service gap um, identification and benchmarking. So this is the relation between, uh, I can say that open access and information literacy. What are the institutional roles? So institution can play a vital role in this, uh, especially in this area. They can you know, build a platform where the people can you know, work together, where the people can share the resources, especially the uh, you know share the knowledge which is related to open access. And there should be policies uh, to use that uh, you know that resources is very important because you need some policies and guidance for open access. And education will help you to know about the resources where it is available and how to evaluate that information and how to look at look at that information easily. So institution can play a role to you know uh, to to do some outreach program with other institutions and that outreach program will help the other people to know about open access resources in this area. So what are Istros University, as I as it mentioned, that I'm working over there. So Istros University and open access. So in Bangladesh, Istros University Library, basically promoting and making people aware about its, its publication research through its open repository, and which is very rich in terms of collection. Uh, and some other you know, institutions and library, they are trying their level best, but uh, it's, it's just university, I can say it's a model for other libraries. And this library also campaign on open access week in every year uh, to promoting the concept of open science, because in developing country like Bangladesh, we, don't, we, uh, we have a lack of uh, concept regarding this open science, open access. And this library also continuously check the quality of the publication for preventing the university community to use this the PG3 publication. 
This is the screenshot of uh, East Coast University Library. It's, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, they are trying their level best to promote open access uh, platform in this uh, sector in, in Bangladesh, especially. Uh, uh, and in this, in, in, in this screenshot, you can see that uh, we have you know, uh, organized the resources department-wise, especially the open access resources. The university is getting resources to the consortium. Uh, there are two consortiums in Bangladesh. One is in Upsbury, uh, and another is UGC Digital Library Consortium. But rather than that, rather than that, subscribe resources, there are many online resources which is basically very much helpful for the community, uh, EW community, East West community. So that's why we have created a portal that is called a department-wise resource portal. And in this portal, we put open access resources which are very basically needed for their academic purpose. And this is another screenshot of uh, institutional repository of East Coast University Library. We're using this space for institutional repository and we put some of the you know, open access resources over there. So in that case, it, uh, it, uh, the community will be benefited to get the resources from here, from this repository. Especially in this uh, COVID-19 situation, we are actually uh, facing a lot of problems to get the right information for the right people at the right time. We are a little bit puzzled. We don't know which information is right, which is wrong, which can be you know, trustable, which is not. So that's why uh, we, we actually created uh, a web portal uh, in our website. Basically, you know that in this pandemic situation, many well-known publishers have made content from online resources and and you know leading some journals freely accessible to to assist the researcher medical uh, you know professionals policy makers and other who are basically you know working to address this health crisis uh, situation and in this connection basically Swiss university created this space and incorporated world renowned publishers novel coronavirus content uh, it's in, in, in one window. So in that case, the community uh, will be benefited. And this space is continuously we're trying to update. Uh, these are the activities actually promoting open access. As I mentioned before, that East Coast University is you know, uh, promoting and uh, observing open access week during a couple of years. And there are some of the pictures of the uh, say, you know activities of the open access week. Um, before pandemic situation, we you know celebrated this open access week um, physically, you know, in, in, in providing some you know access to the users. But during this pandemic, it's now very difficult. So we um, do organize some webinar which is related to open access, and we observe the open access week virtually because this is a pandemic situation of you know, it's just, we are bound to uh, you know celebrate this uh, you know virtually so this is my presentation and i hope uh, I, I i try to get idea about in bangladesh what we are doing we are uh, especially in open access week but in my observation i will found that in our country we have a lack of um, you know our policy and uh, and the mindset is different in, in, in Bangladesh because people are thinking that uh, open access resources are not trustworthy and they are not taking this that resources easily and they are not actually aware of resource that uh, open access resources which is available uh, in in, uh, over, in different different you know websites so that's why we are trying our level best to create awareness among the uh, information professionals and other stakeholders to know about these resources and uh, from that uh, you know point of view they will be benefited and we are also uh, uh, trying to work with some uh, stakeholders to develop some uh, you know initiative to create more awareness about this open access and we, we also see that some of the stakeholder or or you know the professionals they don't I uh, know what are the pituitary uh, open access resources, what are not. So these are also very challenging uh, job for us to give them uh, the, uh, to take the initiative to give them, uh, provide to and acquire that knowledge, or acquire that skill to find out the right information, find out the authentic information. 
Um, so these are the things I, I'm trying to cover it in my uh, presentation, but if there is any question, I'll be happy to answer your question. Thank you for being with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Begum. That was fantastic. And it was also, it was really powerful to hear what you were saying about the need to promote open access and also sometimes overcome distrust. I mean, there's a lot of concern about predatory open access journals out there. And so how can we actually make sure that people don't get their fingers burnt by coming across something that isn't high quality, given there is so much high quality work out there. So now, in fact, I would like to turn to Juan Miguel Diaz, um, who is the director of the UN Information Center for the Caribbean, a role that he's held since, 20, uh, a role that he's held since 2014. Previously, he was director ad interim of the UN Information Center in Mexico City. Um, before joining the UN, he worked in Mexico as a reporter and producer with television, uh, with television Azteca, and as a writer, editor, and reporter for El, El Invasionista and El Heraldo de Mexico. He has been particularly active in work to develop and promote the UN Verified Initiative, which I think we're going to hear more about now. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Juan Miguel. Thank you very much, Steve, and, and uh, thanks to IFLA for inviting me to participate in this in this panel. It's been fascinating to listen to, to our colleagues and their rich experiences around the planet. Um, well, as you were saying, I, I, I'm a journalist. I consider myself a journalist, where I've been working for the UN for 24 years uh, on information. And uh, But if I, if I have to make a confession, I will tell you that my happy place or my happy places are libraries. Uh, that's, that's where I find myself the happiest ever. So I, I truly want to recognize and congratulate the, the efforts of all the information specialists and all the librarians around the planet to, to keep finding creative ways of, of surviving and being uh, and doing their important job during this, this, this pandemic. And while I'm, uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by technology, uh, I must say that like I haven't found anything that parallels to this pleasure of finding that one paragraph in that old dusty book in the end of shelves, in the end of a shelf. And to get to that book, there was always an intermediary, and that's that's the librarian, the best partner to any researcher, uh, and that's a role that we not always have on this uh, on on this uh, amazing access to information that we have nowadays, as as you've been you've been sharing. So allow me to share uh, uh, this uh, UN campaign. I'll be sharing my screen as well. Uh, I hope you can see it now. Uh, that was launched last year as a reaction to. Uh, the very serious situation with misinformation around the planet as uh, the pandemic developed around the planet. Uh, the name of the campaign is called Verified, and I hope you will find it as interesting as we do in the UN if you are not already participating in it. Uh, Verified was, uh, as I was saying, a reaction to this uh, parallel pandemic uh, that we're now calling misinformation. And we soon realized, uh, many, of the many of the panelists have, have mentioned it before, how critical having access to not only information, but the right information, the verified information, the true scientific uh, was uh, during this pandemic, or is still is today during this pandemic, uh, accurate information, verified information. And uh, while now we now have access to endless amounts of information, essentially every single bit and piece of, of, of knowledge in the history of humanity, finding the right information can be trickier, sometimes even expensive, as, as the colleagues have been mentioned. Uh, and, and sorting through this uh, uh, sea of information is even more complicated. Information specialists, of course, uh, uh, researchers have the tools and the skills to sort through different kinds of information, but that's not something that the average citizen might have or might be even wanting to have. Uh, and nowadays we all need to, to have those skills to sort out through, through, through the information that we have access to. So Verify is an initiative of the UN, in particular of the Department of Global Communications, uh, along with a, a key partner, an, an agency that is at the forefront of developing a behavioral modification a campaigns that is purpose. And the idea was to provide people with life-saving information that's fact-based, that's science-based, science -based, but also to create the basis of a more equitable, more, more um, fair uh, or fairer uh, uh, recovery from the, from the pandemic. And this is by communicating a human or even humane way, if you will. Uh, Verified started very early in the, in the pandemic, as, as far back as March uh, 2020. And at the beginning, it was just about 
finding creative ways of communicating science, uh, very basic life-saving science. I mean, from how to uh, wear a, a mask if necessary, uh, what not to do with masks, like sharing it. That's uh, uh, there's a graphic there in Spanish, not to take them off while while speaking. And essentially, the the, the hope was to flood the internet with science, uh, science of all kinds, not just uh, medical or health related, but also uh, the economics, uh, social, and so on and so forth, including human rights. As you as you well as you are well aware, the pandemic ran in parallel with other pandemics, gender based violence. Uh, inequality and so on and so forth. So uh, this gap was meant to be filled by, by, by verified with information obviously coming from all of our sources, uh, uh, all of our specialists within the UN uh, and then some including external partners, of course. Uh, very soon it evolved into not just conveying the right information but also uh, combating uh, myths and misinformation. So uh, from providing people with the information or the skills to how to sort through the information that they had available and how to identify myths. And some of them are in, in, in the screen. Uh, I mean, I love some of them and you probably have a collection by now uh, yourselves uh, from uh, the mosquitoes being uh, a way of acquiring uh, COVID-19 to uh, being safe if you were under the sun, high temperatures killing it, 5G, uh, uh, cell phones propagating the virus. And my personal favorite, how by by eating chili peppers, you, you might get rid of the virus and then some. Uh, so of course, while this might sound ridiculous sometimes, uh, a lot of people around the planet actually believe those. So we needed something that would counter this kind of information and that's where Verified came. Uh, this uh, this uh, content was, was based on our own monitoring of the trends uh, globally of what was out there and what was being said about the pandemic. Uh, as you know, we have uh, uh, offices on the ground in most countries around the planet. So we're in a very good position to monitor what's happening and to try to provide the creators or the, the creatives behind this campaign with the right information at the right time. Uh, as the pandemic evolved and science evolved with it, uh, we, we are reaching the point where scientists were about to develop uh, or, or to, to be successful in developing a, a, a vaccine. And then while that was happening, of course, uh, skepticism grew at the same rate or even higher or faster. Anti-vaxxers came about and it came a, a moment came for we needed to teach the basics. I mean, stuff that you normally uh, learn about in school as to how vaccines are developed, how they work and how they made our life as we know it possible. Uh, there is a there is a video there that we were screening about about uh, smallpox. But I mean, I can tell you myself that the generation of my mother was affected by polio. And that was never something that ran through my mind when I was going to school. I mean, I never saw a colleague of mine, a peer of mine with, with polio, but my mom suffered that. Uh, so so it, it is because of uh, vaccines that we're here today, we're having this conversation. And that's a message that the UN wanted to convey. Um, uh, but how to do it? Uh, do we just make fun of people who, who think differently from us, who, who do not believe in science? Or do we take the time to actually understand the reasoning, the motivations, the emotions behind it. So the UN with other partners, partners in the academy and, and, and civil society developed a guide uh, for communicating about vaccines that, that analyzes all these implications uh, in, uh, and provides very, very, very interesting tools to be able to, to get the message across and to do so bearing in mind the needs and the, and the context of recipients of these messages. The, the, the pandemic evolved and the campaign evolved with it. Uh, at around June last year, uh, one phase of the pandemic was pledged to pause. And essentially there was a, a call to people to pause, to take a minute before sharing information. And that's so important. I, I mean, I, I there ask everyone in this forum if you have not shared some fake news or some misinformation in the last uh, 15 months or so, I have myself. Uh, and and, 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 it, 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 uh, and I, it would have been prevented from doing it had I taken just 30 seconds of my time uh, to verify the sources of said information uh, and, and see if, uh, if it was worth, worthwhile uh, sharing. So the UN and its partners called people to pause before sharing uh, and created a number of, of uh, uh, messages to encourage people to do so. And very practical information, like how to identify the sources. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not true. 
Uh, if it sounds too controversial, it's probably not true, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, the campaign has been very successful so far. Obviously, there's so much to, to do still, but it reached more than 1 billion people in just the first year. Uh, it has created content in more than 50 languages and more than 1,000 pieces of art. It has, I guess, more importantly, uh, amassed over 120,000 partners in disseminating and amplifying this information. The, the last uh, phase or the phase that we're currently in, and all these phases run concurrently because different countries and different regions are at different points in the pandemic, uh, uh, it deals with equity and solidarity. So the message, of course, is to try to make vaccine distribution equitable, but at the same time to make, to make vaccines credible in the places where there's, uh, where there's access to vaccines. Uh, and we're still fighting misinformation and the likes. The, obviously, the rationale behind it is that no one will be safe until everyone is safe. So the Secretary General has been very, very um, uh, forceful, very energetic in conveying these messages to member states and to other partners, make vaccines accessible to everyone. You've seen the news today, and you know how, how what a huge disparity there is in this distribution. Uh, I, I'll spare you some of these messages because you probably know them already. These are how these messages are translated into graphics. And the emotional aspect is that we truly all want to go back to something that resembles normal. We, go, we want to go back to dancing, to cheering, to learning, to meeting with friends, to liming, as they say in the Caribbean, which is partying. Uh, uh, and that won't happen until every one of us has access to, to, to equitable health. Uh, on the political side of things, there is a very interesting uh, development. Member states uh, have made uh, declarations on access to, to vaccines. Uh, I'd I like to uh, bring your attention to the General Assembly's resolution last year about uh, media and information literacy, which is essentially about securing access to information for everyone. Uh, and uh, every single celebration this year, including World Press Freedom Day, has been dedicated to that. How can I help? Just join us, I mean, be part of this. And I think no one is in a better position because no one has the, the trust of people as high as librarians and, library, uh, and, and, and libraries. So just by joining this, this movement, I'm pretty sure that we can make a, a massive difference. Uh, I, I, I rushed through the, through the uh, slides, but what I will do is I'll copy these uh, um, sources, these links on the, on the chat so you can learn more about this. Uh, over to you, Stephen, thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Miguel. That was fantastic. And, and I, I think it's, it's such a good example of actually taking scientific information, sort of information that is available through open access, but really making it attractive, helping get into people's minds, get onto their social media feed so that people are receiving, everyone is really receiving the benefits of open access to new scientific material in particular. So now I'd like to hand actually back to Thanos Janakopoulos, um, who introduced us and to introduce him in turn, he's the Chief Librarian of the United, uh, United Nations Headquarters, where he's re-envisioned re re the library as an open space for public dialogue, debate and knowledge sharing, as well as an essential component for the management of the UN's parliamentary and research digital output. He's also strongly promoted public dissemination of UN content through the UN Digital Library and several new scholarly communication and digital workflow products. With that, over to you, Thanos. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh... Um, I mean, uh, I'm humbled actually to speak uh, after all these wonderful uh, positions and interventions. Um, it's going to make my work a little bit easier because uh, my colleague uh, Juan already mentioned one of the initiatives that uh, I wanted to also stress out today, which is the Verified Campaign. And may I just add that librarians have worked in the Verified Campaign. So when it came to misinformation and identifying sources, the UN came back to librarians, which is the UN librarians. Um, at the same time, uh, the member states in the latest uh, uh, meeting of the Committee on Information have uh, declared their endorsement of this wonderful campaign. And there is a request for a new campaign to continue with the major issue of vaccine hesitancy. However, what I wanted to uh, mostly talk about is actually one of the examples uh, from the work of the UN headquarters library and uh, offer some thoughts about uh, the use of repositories and what repositories perhaps could look today. 
So, um, I mean, evidently it is important that all information that is generated by the UN is digitally captured, managed and preserved for current usage and posterity and disseminated as extensively as possible. Our institutional repository, the United Nations Digital Library, released in late 2017, is a product of collaboration among the United Nations Headquarters Library and the UN Libraries in Geneva, Vienna, Beirut, and recently Bangkok. In 2020, during the pandemic, the repository became a vital tool for remote research work. It recorded more than 5 million unique downloads from over 5,000 cities worldwide. In 2021, the repository received the Youth Gentium Research Award from the American Society of International Law and International Legal Research Interest Group. In selecting the UN Digital Library as this year's award recipient, the offices of the International Legal Research Group stated the selection was in recognition that this resource is one-stop shopping for primary documents crucial to most areas of international law, as this refines and builds a centralized source for all United Nations documented activity, and so provides legal materials embedded in the context of the work of the entire UN system. This uh, central repository was developed at the UN headquarters, as mentioned, and it is based on open source technology, catering to governing, connecting, and leveraging the information and knowledge pools created by UN libraries around the world since 1946. It is a multilingual platform that implements international standards and digital stewardship, allowing for demand-driven, scalable operations to be managed locally at regional offices. The headquarters library and its stellar team of research librarians, on top of our metadata experts and information systems managers, has accompanied the launch of the repository with dedicated training on how to use the system. The trainings were offered to researchers, parliamentarians, diplomats, and virtually nowadays to any citizen in the world who has an interest in the UN deliberations. The librarians engage directly with our community, which has solidified the repository's position as a credible research tool. For organizations such as the United Nations, the open nature of our born digital output is the dominant paradigm. And that has been the foundation for our rep repository design and success. The only constant, however, is change. Openness alone doesn't guarantee equity, nor is it enough to counter the rising wave of misinformation and disinformation on all walks of modern societal life. And the sheer complexity of the UN information landscape demands a technological upgrade as well as a more robust information architecture. As successful as our initiative uh, has been, there is room to update its scope, connect it with other repositories, as well as address the need to make it more research-centric. United Nations librarians are now envisioning it as an open, distributed, globally networked infrastructure for IGO scholarly communications. In other words, our repository now faces similar challenges to those faced by numerous institu institutional repositories around the world. The widespread deployment of repository system provides indeed the foundation for an open distributed globally networked infrastructure for scholarly communications. However, repository platforms are using technologies and protocols designed a long time, a long time ago, I think some 20 years ago, before the boom of the web and the dominance of Google, social networking, semantic web and ubiquitous mobile devices. To recover better, we will need to equip our repositories with a wider array of roles and functionalities based on web interoperability. We need to envision the repositories as social machines, per the suggestion put forward by Jim Hendler and Tim Berners-Lee, and quote, create abstract social machines on the web, processes in which the people do the creative work and the machine does the administration. Doesn't this remind you a little bit of Twitter? Librarians, knowledge and information managers, as all of you have uh, clearly uh, identified, are social machine designers for scholarly communications. They can devise an added layer of online repository of web tools, allowing groups of users to create, share, and evolve a new suite of open and interacting social machines. They can create the underlying architectural principles to guide the design and efficient engineering of new web components for new social software applications. They can provide mechanisms that make the social properties of information sharing explicit 
and that guarantee the users of this information conform to the relevant social policy expectations of researchers. There are already many attempts by repositories worldwide to provide an integrated discovery experience over multiple resource, resource types and workflows. For example, both materials like CDs, etc., and books, licensed materials, uh, architect, excuse me, databases, e-journals, etc., and institutional digital materials like digitized specialized collections or embedded suits of learning materials, on-demand information, literacy trainings, and, and so on. A repository as a social machine can provide APIs, persistent identifiers, versioning, self-publishing options, fair data, creative common licensing at the resource level, authentication, annotation, commentary and review, including social media networking options, a break away from each factor usage, and a use of broader group of metrics and increasingly linked data, trustworthiness certification, and the list goes on and on. As the waves of misinformation and disinformation have showcased context, which was also very much uh, highlighted by Juan before, is still the leading element that makes information meaningful for researchers and the public. And, the report and repositories designed a social machine can incorporate the necessary context and contribute to better access to research for all. In this way, the library as an information and data broker becomes more resilient, an organic actor in the research and learning environment of its community and can reinforce equitable participation in knowledge sharing while implementing the necessary barrier-free access to information for both readers and authors. In close collaboration with other scholarly communication cycle actors, the library can propose open models that guarantee charge-free sharing of, resource, of research results and data, or a trade-off model where results sharing in research infrastructure rich countries can assist authors in developing research ecosystems to publish the work, or even assist the readers to consult scientific content freely. COVID-19 has clearly manifested the importance of open access to research information sharing and the undisputed value of open science. Open science, as many of you already have declared, is based on principles such as inclusion, fairness, equity, and sharing, and ultimately seeks to change the way research is done, who is involved in it, and how it is valued. It is the foundation work which, as current evidence supports, accelerates the implementation of all SDGs, and particularly SDG 17, target 16, which quotes, among other things, that we need to strengthen international cooperation on and access to science, technology, and innovation, and enhance knowledge sharing on mutually agreed terms, unquote. As open science encompasses a variety of practices, and uh, I think Jonathan uh, elaborated very uh, clearly on this, um, I'm talking about open access publications, open research data, open source software, open source tools, open workflows, citizen science, open educational resources, and alternative methods for research evaluation, including open peer review. Governments and institutions need to seriously and swiftly con consider standardizing the application of open science practices nationally and internationally. By facilitating open science through policies and governance, National research infrastructures are becoming core enablers of the SDGs. Provision of credible and authoritative scientific information, as the pandemic has proven, is the thread that can tie societies together, the thread that links all of the SDGs and expedites their implementation across fields of industry and research and among communities and social stratifications, ensuring that, at least among those with internet access, no one can be left behind, which is the ethical imperative of the Agenda 2030. We at the UN Headquarters Library are doing our best to raise the visibility of open science, and we were quite lucky to have been able to create the first open science conference at the UN Secretariat in collaboration with Spark in 2019. Alas, we missed a year in 2020, but we are now ready to organize our second Open Science Conference where we'll, we'll follow up on all the um, outcomes of the 2019 conference. And I'd, I'd like to invite you all to 
participate in it and raise the visibility of open science as much as possible. That is one of the tying thread of the implementation of all the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanos. And I think, especially from my point of view, it's really important that you mentioned that in SDG goal 17, 16, this really should be the target, the open access target. And hopefully more and more we will see that being, those two just being associated with each other. Um, we're running slightly over time and I understand that some people need to leave, but hopefully you can spare another five minutes. And for this, I'm going to hand over to Valtas Khalil, who is the director of the Anand Santa Cruz Library at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. He's a very, he's a very powerful, a very active advocate for open science, organizing events and sharing knowledge across the region. Previously, he was executive writer, executive director of the European Association of Research Libraries. With that, over to you, Valtas. Good afternoon, and, and thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for organizing this. Um, it was really great to, uh, to hear all the panelists. So um, we are under pressure of time. So I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists to, to be very brief. Um, it's uh, a question about partnerships. Um, if we want to increase the visibility of reliable information, uh, give access to reliable information, fight misinformation, uh, we cannot do this together. So my question is about partnerships. Um, what partnerships do you see both on a national and international level um, to make sure that we achieve this sustainable development through open access and open science? Um, who, uh, who will start? One minute, please, for, for every panelist. Who will give the... Who will be the first one? All right, uh, go on. Omo, go ahead. Hi, yes, I was, um, one minute. So in, in you know, I, I was talking about the context in which, you know, the um, researchers and the institutions and countries in a particular region needed to be proactive in defining and implementing local uh, and global policies so that they could satisfy the needs in the environment. So that, that says that, you know, um, we see the NRENs and the libraries as the academic libraries for a start, as the our primary stakeholder community. Uh, we think that they are in that in that mix. We see um, the the governments and the funders of uh, of open infrastructures of all sorts being in the same space. And then if these partners sort of work in, in a framework that they define. Then it might be it might be possible to limit some of the challenges that you mentioned. That's my one minute. Great. Thank you so much, Omo. Amazing. Who else? Um, can uh, I, oh. Ellen, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so, so um, I, I just want is one. Um, I think that we sometimes forget when we look at partnerships, and that is that. I really think here we need to uh, expand the concept of the triple helix, and that includes then also the community engagement um, in the concept of you know industry, government, and the academic institutions to come together to identify the research and, uh, agenda. And I think it's it's very important because unless we actually bring the citizens in um, and that they can participate with governments as a partnership then we're going to continue to have uh, problems with actually um, taking this forward. Thank you so much. Jonathan. Uh, yes, well, uh, I think that a good first step uh, could be to involve and coordinate the different actors in the open access and open science movement. And of course, this includes libraries and library associations. But on the other hand, uh, we should consider the multiple actors in the development of knowledge. I mean, there are several areas of knowledge and many of them are not well represented in the debates around open access. And of course, there are libraries in all of these areas that could be a great partners. Uh, this is because there is an urgent need for a multidimensional view uh, as science respond to multiple needs also. That will be my 
remark. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, Dilara. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that three partnerships are very important uh, for this, uh, you know, um, academic library setting. That is one I would like to mention that is partnership with the stakeholder. That means authority and user. That is very important to connection between authority and the user. Second one, partnership with these publishers in quality control. And third one is partnership with government organizations. So, so these three are very key, you know, academic settings is needed for partnership. And rather than this, uh, in Bangladesh, actually, uh, we have a national education policy, which is established in 2010. And the Bangladesh government actually incorporate uh, lifelong learning in that policy. That is also is a good hope, hope in Bangladesh to, to work on open access initiative. And I think that we need to build, a, uh, it's my personal opinion, to build a South Asian a regional network for open access initiative. So in that case, we can work together. The several countries can, you know, the South Asian country can work together to implement some policy, to create some policy and talk to our government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dilara. We move now to Juan Miguel. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and I mean, absolutely, the partnerships are the way to go or the only way to go in, in achieving success on, on, on this uh, endeavor. Uh, for the UN, uh, every partner counts. Uh, partnering with the creative uh, community, uh, advertising agencies, people who know how to translate content into something that is attractive and, and uh, easy to understand is, is obviously super important. But then as we were talking, as we were saying, uh, you trust the information depending on the source that it's coming from. So maybe if it's a family member, it's more valuable to you. If it's a, a religious uh, leader, for example, it's also more valuable, maybe a superstar, uh, an actor, etc. So partnering with all these uh, different entities in societies is fundamental. And the UN has been doing that. Uh, very successfully with this with this uh, verified campaign so far. Thank you so much, Juan Miguel, and finally Thanos. Yes. Um, so nothing much to add. I think um, as uh, Juan just mentioned, every partnership counts. When we're talking about implementation of the SDGs, everything we do counts. From uh, the basic communication with our family members on, um, you know, on the the benefit of sharing clinical trial results and what that what that means for vaccinations, and you know, um, uh, updating uh, our friends on why this vaccine was developed so fast. It's because so so much capital went into it, and then processes were done simultaneously rather than one after the other as it happened. But also, uh, I'd like to refer back to the to the outcome document from the 2019 conference on open science, where we had uh, 19 eminent personalities from around the world and a lot from Latin America. And there was one uh, major challenge that was identified by all of us, and that was the last mile, which is always the most interesting problem to focus on. How are we going to be able to bring the broader community of researchers on board? And what are the ways to incentivize the open sharing of science and accelerate progress towards the, the SDGs? So how are we going to incentivize uh, the open sharing of science among the researcher community? How are we going to bring them on board? And also, how are we going to um, emphasize that, for example, the most popular research is not the most beneficial research for society sometimes? So this is a, a clear problem that we will have to find the necessary actors in the scholarly communication cycle and just target these particular actors so we can get this last point, this last mile issue through. Thank you so much, Thanos. And um, thank you so much to, uh, to the panel uh, for uh, providing us with these great presentations and, and the comments after, afterwards. Um, I give back the floor to, uh, to Stephen. Uh, to, to close this session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Salta, and thank you everyone for participating. Uh, I apologize again that we have run over a little bit. Um, there were a couple of extra questions we had prepared um, to ask our panelists, but what we might actually do is if there are immediate answers, we can ask for those in writing. We will publish the um, we will publish the recording of this event and the links that have been shared by our panelists uh, shortly. 
we'll make sure that everyone who's registered for this event gets that link and so it'll be possible to share the information there. But with that, I'm aware it's late for some of us. Um, it's definitely gone lunch time for others. So I simply want to thank everyone for their participation. Thank you for your insights on all the different areas where action may be necessary, will be helpful in order to realize the potential of open access, which as you all said almost unanimously is so vital for achieving development. What are those steps we need to take to actually realize that potential? We've had so many ideas here and I hope that in the coming months, years, we'll see a lot more progress towards realizing that. So with that, thank you very much to everyone and I wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Stay safe.